This is chapter four, Atoms and Elements, and we're continuing here with section three, where we're going to learn about the atom and the structure of the atom. Now, an atom is the smallest particle of an element that retains some of the characteristics of the element. We'll see later on that you can break an atom down into even smaller particles, but those particles are no longer anything like the element that we're dealing with. So the smallest particle that's still a part of the element is an atom. For instance, in a sample of pure aluminum foil, all of the particles that make it up are identical aluminum atoms. So the goals of this presentation are to be able to describe some of the properties of the subatomic particles, the particles that make up the atom, and how they are structured within an atom. Our modern atomic theory begins in the early 19th century, the early 1800s, um, but the idea of an atom actually goes back much farther. In ancient Greece, the philosopher Democritus believed that if you kept dividing matter into smaller and smaller pieces, eventually you would get to a point where you couldn't cut the pieces any smaller. Those pieces, which could not be cut, were called uh, atoms or something like that. So it comes from the Greek word. Uh, unable to be cut or indivisible. Um, that idea in ancient Greece was not very well accepted. They actually believed more in the idea that matter came or was composed of uh, the four elements, wind, fire, earth, and water. Uh, so the idea of the atom in ancient Greece was not really taken too seriously. And it wasn't until several thousand years later in the Middle Ages, around the 15th century, that um, Greek alchemists sort of revived the idea of the atom. And then uh, several hundred years after that, when modern scientists began to really take that idea seriously and they came up with the atomic theory. Uh, now, like any scientist, John Dalton did not come up with this all on his own, right? So first of all, he was probably aware of much of that history. And he also uh, worked on building on ideas from other scientists around him just prior to him. Okay, so atoms, again, are the smallest particles of matter in some sense, although you will see that they can be broken down into even small particles of matter. Uh, all atoms of an element are identical to each other. This is a very important part of Dalton's atomic theory, right? All of the atoms of aluminum are identical to one another. All of the atoms of carbon are identical to one another. But all of the atoms of aluminum are somehow different from the atoms of carbon. Dalton didn't know at the time exactly what this difference was, but he knew enough from his experiments and from other people's experiments that they, there had to be some difference. And also atoms from, of different types, in other words, different elements, can combine together in simple ratios, right? Since you have these small indivisible units, you can start combining them in simple whole number ratios. And these combinations are the different compounds that we're aware of, right? And compounds, which are arrangements of atoms, can then rearrange into new structures or new arrangements, uh, and that is what is called a chemical reaction. Okay? And in this type of chemical reaction, atoms are never created or destroyed. Okay? So later on, it was understood that you, know, you could take an atom and smash it into pieces and get a bunch of energy out of it. And you could convert between mass and energy and all that. Um, but in an ordinary chemical reaction, atoms are conserved. They're never created and they're never destroyed. So in an atom, there are a few subatomic particles. Okay? So within an atom, there are protons, which have a positive charge. There are electrons, which have a negative charge, and there are neutrons, which have no charge, or are neutral, or a zero charge. Um, from basic physics, we know that positive charges will repel one another. So if you try and bring two positive charges close together, they will feel uh, repulsion between them. They'll want to separate. If you bring two negative charges close together, they'll also repel. But if you bring a positive near a negative, those opposites will attract one another. Okay? So opposites attract is the rule for charged particles. Today we take a lot of our understanding of the structure of an atom for granted, but in the 19th century it wasn't known that the atoms were made of these kinds of particles. And so experiments were being done and actually carried out to try and determine uh, what made up an atom. So one series of experiments was performed by a scientist named J.J. Thompson using what's called a cathode ray tube. 
Okay? If you're uh, my age, a little bit older, you might know uh, old style televisions as being CRT televisions. CRT in those televisions stands for cathode ray tube because the image on the screen of the TV was generated by a cathode ray at the back of it. So it's a cathode ray. Well, you don't really need to know too much about this, but basically the idea is you have a positive and a negative electrode and you run a voltage between them. So you have one side is positive and one side is negative. And if you create a high enough voltage between these two, the negative side will sort of pull little pieces of matter off of the opposite side. And you can take those pieces that are being pulled off at very high speeds and you can direct them towards a screen or through a tube where they land on the other side of the tube at the screen and they form an image, right? That's how TVs work. Before it was used for TVs though, it was used to perform these kinds of experiments. So it was known um, based on how these particle beams formed from the cathode, how they bent in a magnetic field, it was understood that these were negatively charged particles. And it was also understood from the way they moved that they were uh, very light. They did not have much mass at all, um, but they were still part of the atom that existed on the cathode side. So there was some piece, some small, very light, uh, low mass piece of negative charge that was being pulled out of the atom as a result of this voltage, okay? And so at some point, this was determined to be a particle that existed within the atom and it was called an electron. Once it was realized that you had electrons coming out of the atom, well, an atom is electrically neutral. So if it loses electrical charge in the form of electrons, then there must be something left behind that has a positive charge. So the initial model based on these experiments was what we call this plum pudding model. Okay? And you can see here, you have a plum pudding in the sense of, well, a plum pudding is a, sort of an English uh, dessert where you have a pudding, you know, sort of gelatinous pudding, and it's got plums in it, okay? Solid, more solid fruits stuck throughout it, and they're sort of uniformly distributed throughout. So that was the idea for this plum pudding model. The positive part of the atom was assumed to be like the pudding sort of matrix of the atom, and then the negatively charged electrons were thought to just be sort of stuck in there like plums in a pudding and uniformly or, or randomly distributed throughout. So testing this idea sometime later, a couple of decades later, um, Ernest Rutherford put his students to work performing some experiments where they took positively charged alpha particles and fired them at a thin layer of gold atoms. Okay, And so the idea here was that since the particles are positively charged, it would give them some information about how the atoms were structured by looking at how they passed through this thin layer of atoms. Okay? If the plum pudding model was correct, then you would expect to see very little deflection of these alpha particles, these positive particles, because even though they might be attracted to a negative part of the electron, the, the plums in the pudding, the overall positive part would sort of cancel that out. And so overall, the positively charged alpha particles would not be expected to deflect or, or bend that much as they pass through a few atoms of gold, right? You might see a, a few fractions of a degree of deflection from the straight path. Okay. Instead, what was observed was that, indeed, most particles did go directly through the gold foil and were not deflected at all. But there was a small but significant percentage that were deflected uh, at very high angles and even sometimes to, deflected backwards to the direction that the beam was coming from. Here you can see some rough diagrams of how these experiments were carried out, right? So on this side, you have uh, the source of the alpha particles and then the alpha particle beam coming out here, firing through this piece of gold foil. And then there's this wraparound detector so that you can detect the particles coming out no matter which, uh, which direction they come out of the gold foil. So again, if the plum pudding model is correct, these should all go directly through and maybe, you know, get deflected a couple of degrees, but all pile up basically here at the end, right? Uh, same thing over here. If this, this is showing a schematic of the way the gold foil is, right? If it's thin enough, it's only a few atoms thick. And so you would expect the alpha particles to sort of go through it. 
But again, what happened was that some of them were deflected at a very large angle, and some of them were deflected so much that they bounced back towards the uh, towards the source, right? And so this is completely inconsistent with the plum pudding model. The only way that this could be rationalized was to assume that there was a small, uh, dense, positively charged nucleus in the center of the atom, and that when these positively charged particles happen to come close to one of these nucleus, one of these positively charged nuclei, they would be deflected back. Whereas any particle that didn't really come near a nucleus would just pass through the large empty space of the electrons around them. So you have a small nucleus and a large region of mostly empty space around them where the negatively charged electrons are. Okay. So these are the conclusions of Rutherford's experiments. Small positively charged nucleus and a large, mostly empty space around them that contains the negatively charged electrons. And then other experiments by other scientists later on also confirmed that there was another uh, particle in the nucleus called the neutron, which had no charge, and the positive charge in the nucleus came from particles called protons. So this gives us our, uh, the beginnings of our modern understanding of atomic structure. If you look at zooming in on a piece of matter, right? So you have some lithium metal here. If you zoom in on it enough, you'll see the lithium atoms all packed together in a regular sort of crystal lattice or crystal array like this. And then if you zoom in on an individual atom close enough, then you can see the region with the electrons in it on the outside here, and then a very, very small nucleus here. The nucleus is uh, much, 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 much smaller in volume than the actual volume of the atom that we consider the volume of the atom where the electrons are. And then if you zoom in on the nucleus itself, you would see that the nucleus itself is made up of neutrons and protons. Okay, so you can see here the atomic diameter is around 10 to the minus 10th meters, and the nuclear diameter is 10 to the minus 15th meters. So it's 100,000 times smaller than the atomic diameter. So since these atoms are so small, it uh, doesn't really make sense to think about their mass in terms of units like grams or kilograms. So instead, a very small mass unit called the atomic mass unit was invented. The atomic mass unit has a mass equal to 1 12th of the mass of the carbon-12 atom. The carbon-12 atom contains six protons and six neutrons. And so we'll understand a little bit later what that means. Carbon-12 is actually a specific isotope of carbon. And we'll get to that a little later on. Uh, in biology, the atomic mass unit is sometimes called the Dalton, partially in honor of the, the chemist Dalton, who came up with this atomic theory. Right? And then the other thing to keep in mind is that the electrons have very, very little mass. Okay? So the electrons have a um, 1,000 times or more, 2,000 times less mass than the protons and the neutrons. Okay? So atoms that gain or lose electrons really don't change the mass much at all, and we often completely neglect the mass of an electron. Here's a chart summarizing uh, some of these properties for the subatomic particles, right? So again, the proton and the neutron have atomic mass units of approximately one. They're not exactly one, um, but they're close to one, and they're also not equal to one another. They're a little bit different from one another. Uh, whereas the electron has a mass that is very, very, very small compared to those. Okay? And then the charge is also important. You have to know that the proton has a positive charge, the electron has a negative charge. Proton's plus one, electron is negative one, so they're equal and opposite. And then a neutron is a zero or neutral charge. And you'll see some of these symbols used throughout the, uh, the slides in the class, so keep in mind the E minus especially is a very important one. We're going to see that a lot. So E to the Superscript minus is uh, represents an electron. So based on these descriptions, which subatomic particles are they talking about? Which particles are found outside the nucleus? Well, the only particles found outside the nucleus are electrons. Which particles have a positive charge? Well, positive charges come from protons. And which have mass but no charge? Well, the no charge particles are neutrons.